Every business is unique. But the ups and downs we experience as we launch and run our businesses are pretty similar. We're Harmon Brothers, the team behind Pooping Unicorns and other weird but successful video ads you've probably seen. We help businesses grow through unforgettable video marketing, and we're no stranger to tricky situations. In fact, we embrace them. The goal of this podcast is to show how your crappy circumstances could be the golden opportunity that leads to your next success. You're watching Poop to Gold. What's up, guys? This is James Dayton, creative director and part owner, partner here at Harmon Brothers, and today I'm sitting in for Benton Crane. Um, and to be clear, nobody knows where Benton is. Benton. If you are listening to this podcast, please call Keith. He's extremely worried about you. Literally nobody has any idea where he is. So let's jump right into it. So today I'm here with Dan, is it Fleischman? Yep. Nailed it, first try. Dan Fleischman is a serial entrepreneur that kills it with basically anything he touches. He's, uh, he's got the Midas touch of small business. Um, he probably started like 10 small businesses this morning alone before you even got out of bed. That's how serial entrepreneur he really is. So, Dan, I want to brag about you in just a second, but first, let's say hi. How are you, man? Thanks for having me. If you want to make like a milk crate with your partner, we can go try to find him. I can have, <laughs> I'll have influencers hold up signs of the milk crate, try to find them. If you if he were younger, we'd Amber alert him in a heartbeat. But uh, <laughs> yeah, just a little bit older for that, unfortunately. Dan, I I read I read over your bio here, and I'm just flabbergasted. At, uh, at what you did at 19 while I was still just uh, playing GoldenEye 007 back on Nintendo 64. I'm blown away here, man. So let me brag about you for just a second. I'm going to read this. Dan, the man, is the founder of Elevator Studio and the youngest founder of a publicly traded company in history. He had an apparel company at age 19, and he moved on to scaling energy drink products. He's launched one of the top five online poker tournaments, along with his various other things, such as public speaking or investing. He owns the Model Citizen Fund, which creates backpacks for homeless people with emergency supply items. And you just barely started another four companies this summer alone, right? You've been busy, my friend. Yeah, life is short. You got to keep moving. <laughs> Life, life is short. Um, I think you're going to have a good uh, 200, 300 businesses under your belt by the time you, uh, you step away from it. And is that the goal or, or what is it you're looking to do here? I feel like every time I invest in it, I've invested in 36 companies outside of my own that I start. I've invested in 36. My goal is every time I invest in these companies, they create more and more jobs, which helps more and more people. So it's kind of like teaching someone to fish or creating more jobs. That helps me emotionally. I don't care about the money part. As money comes in, I just deploy it out. I don't keep money. I just keep deploying it into more and more and more companies and more and more businesses. So that's my fun goal for this. It's not like, ooh, I want all this money. <laughs> I, have, I haven't owned a car in six years. I've had the same watch for 12 years. Like I don't buy, I don't buy stuff. I buy companies. Like I invest in companies. That's my fun. You sound like the case study from the book Millionaire Next Door. You sound like that exact same guy. It was one of the first books I ever read. Isn't it so good? Yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, you also remind me of the quote that Aaron Sorkin had in The Social Network when he said, we don't, uh, we don't take jobs, we make jobs. That's you, isn't it? I love that. Yeah. That is so awesome. So you said that you've invested into some companies, but obviously you're originating some products for some companies as well. Um, are you just constantly on the lookout for that next big thing? Or are you constantly uh, looking for a certain... Uh, kind of portfolio allocation that says, look, I'm 50% here, I'm 50% here in origination. Well, what's your goal there? Sure. So I wouldn't mind if I stack up in one main category. That that part I'm unemotional about. I throw investment events. I've thrown 38 events called Elevator Nights that are totally free. So it costs me 400 grand a year to keep them free. There's no tickets, no sponsors, no sales. But for me, I get to cherry pick companies that I meet, entrepreneurs that I meet at these events. So I don't mind spending all that money to create the events. And I have 300 to 1,000 entrepreneurs and investors attend. And that helps me find people, networking, and hopefully cut a check. So when I say 36 companies, it sounds like a lot. But over seven years, if you think about it, that's really only like four to six, five, seven companies per year. So it's not like I'm investing at everything I see. I don't have shiny object syndrome. I'm really picking every few months that right company. But if I found two in the same week or three in the same week, I don't care. It's not that. I don't have that kind of asset allocation. I have an entrepreneur allocation. If mm -hmm. I see an entrepreneur I believe in, I want to lock them in. Yeah. They're really fast and aggressive. And I want to give them all the money they need. I'll bring my friends to fund them as well. Like I want to lock them in 
and help them scale. Well, and through these events that you're talking about, you've brilliantly set up this massive funnel where you can take a uh, look across a huge breadth of products and, and like you said, cherry pick uh, the ones that resonate with you individually, right? I want to know if you have like a certain litmus test or a certain criteria of what type of product you go after. Is it like, hey, I want, you know, uh, a two million cap style product or I want, uh, you know, something that that has uh, a margin of $60 or something that can be sold, uh, you know, primarily to women 35 to 44. If there's a universality or a certain universal pain point, what's, what's, your, what's your constraint for what you let through the door into your portfolio? So most importantly, it's the entrepreneur and the founder. That's what I'm really truly betting on because companies change, products change over time due to situations like COVID or anything that pops up. Entrepreneurs have to change their product and course. So that's my first bet. The product has to be something that I can help. So if they're a consumer product, apparel, uh, food and beverage, things like that, fitness products, those are companies that I know I can help because my social media agency, I spend around $60 million with influencers. So I know I can get influencers to do campaigns awesome. way cheaper or free because they owe me favors because I spend so much money every year with all these influencers. <laughs> favors, this is the currency, is favors. I like that. Yeah. Exposure and favors. That's fantastic. Right. And so... If I find the right entrepreneur and I find that they have the right product, I'm open whether it's a juice company, a food and beverage company, a snack company, they have a music label. I'm, I'm agnostic. I don't really care what that is as long as it's something that consumers can buy that I can help make famous. If I can do that, then I'm, I'm in. And again, I don't mind if it's like four snack companies in a row, fine. If it's three different restaurant chains, fine. If it's four fashion brands, fine. Like we own a brand called Talentless with Scott Disick and we were the, we came in right from the very, very beginning. Now the company does eight figures in sales. We didn't raise money from anybody else. It was just us. There was dollar beard club, which is now called the beard club. Yep. I was the very first one there, helped them get it started. I got them their first 11,800 members doing all the social media campaigns. Awesome. And then, then Bilzerian comes in and invests in the company and $28 million later. Great. We never raised any other money. And so, some of the brands I'm taking a gamble before they even are, they haven't grown yet. They haven't sprouted their seeds yet. I, and I'm just gambling on those guys. And so. Which I'd imagine frequently has the greatest upside because of that amount of risk that you take on, correct? Yes, absolutely. We invested in trendybutler.com, uh, men's fashion, mm -hmm. where you get like a monthly box. Very first, we were the first 150 grand. Then my friends put in 1.1 million more. And then boom, the rest is history. They're also over 20 million revenue. So we took a big risk because when we invested, they were like this big. They were barely shipping their boxes on time, barely getting their clothing on time. They didn't, they had to work through a lot of things. But as you said, I believed in them and I'm willing to take a big risk. So there is a big reward at the end. That's fantastic. On the flip side, um, it, it sounds like, like you mentioned, you're agnostic towards the product as long as it's something that you are confident that can scale. On the flip side, what are things that you don't want to touch and why? So... I don't want to touch anything that's too edgy. So I don't touch, I don't touch sexual Like products. poop products, things like that. Yeah. I won't do anything, <laughs> uh, I don't do anything political, religious, sexual, race. I don't touch anything that has that like edge or you know that half the market's going to be mad at you. I don't do that whatsoever. Good for you. And I also Good don't for do you. one hit wonders. Like if you're just going to be something that pops and scales, I've done that before and I realized it's very short-sighted. Like I did a hoverboard, right? When the hoverboards were crazy, I knew there was going to be a big fad. So I started a hoverboard company. We did 5.4 million in sales in four months. And then the, the week after Christmas, hoverboards don't exist anymore. I got lucky that the last 8,400 units I had a chain store bought for me. But if I didn't have that hookup, I would, I would have lost six figures in that scenario of that 8,400 units sitting in a warehouse. And so... I don't do that anymore. I, I look at companies, even though I know something could be a big fad, like somebody right now today is making a flies like the, because the fly that was on the president or the vice president's head during the conference, they're making little fly toys, like little flies, swatters, genius idea for like today. six, Tomorrow? six days, right? Right. For this week, hilarious. They're going to probably do six or seven figures in sales. And then by the time they ship it, nobody will care. Right. And so I don't do that stuff anymore. I focus on brands and products that I can scale in perpetuity. Well, and I'd love to point out to our audience too, if you get too edgy, it's one of the reasons why we stay away from swearing and, and getting 
uh, too far across that edge with poop products and pee products and other things like that. Um, as people start flagging your content, it, it literally hits your ad account and your CPMs, your cost per thousand impressions, actually take a hit because of it. And so it actually drives up your advertising costs to be too edgy if people are just flagging you left and right. So that's actually a really great constraint. And I think it's smart to stay within your own constraints because A, when you go outside of your own value system, uh, you may have short-term pops, but A, is even worth it to you per right. personally, right? To, to push something disgusting. And B, um, it's a short-term pop. It's, it's not as short-sighted and it's not a long-term strategy. So I think, that's- I think you guys, I think what Harmon Brothers did amazing is take something that was edgy or, you know, people wouldn't talk about it and you made it clean cut and people could talk about it because it's, it's poo now instead of the curse word, right? You yeah. made it something that like kids could talk about and I would feel fine if a five-year-old said it to me Whereas other products, or if you would have said it the month before you launched, I'd be like, I can't believe you said that. Don't talk like that. Right. You guys made it so clean cut and fun to talk about that I think you literally changed the way people look at going to the restroom. The, the way I think about it is we go as far as what moms will actually say to their kids in the way they'll say it to their kids. Because then you've got a whole, you know, PG style of, uh, of comedy that the whole family gets, gets around to watch with these For poop sure. jokes, right? So much fun. So I've got to ask you, because Poop to Gold is our title, what was your, your kind of low point as you're trying to figure out a model that predictably works for you? Because obviously, you're in this turnkey model automated place that works and works and works and works in a predictable fashion. But coming up with that turnkey model that works, what was, what was the bottom for you and what did that look like? Sure, there was a lot of roller coasters along the way. I, I never had money growing up. You know, we had a family of four making 24 grand a year in LA. So two grand a month in LA, the, you know. And so yeah. I know what it was like to just not have food or not have, you know, like we, were, we weren't homeless, but we were just not. And so I realized I had to always work and there was always situations that were gonna come up because even when I was 18, 19 years old, we went and did a million dollars in sales and our manufacturer screwed us over because they overcharged us by 300%. We then get a $9.5 million licensing deal, right? Starter Apparel gives us $9.5 million licensing deal. And the first legal bill was like 220 grand when it should have been like 30 grand. Mm -hmm. And so because I was young, I was 19, 20, 21, 22, I kept noticing people trying to take advantage of me. And so I started trying to do whatever I could to prevent those situations. The worst one was online poker. So I used to own a poker site, one of the top five poker brands in the world called Victory Poker. I had Dan Bilzerian, DJ Steve Aoki, Playboy Playmates, all these characters that were the faces of the poker site. Built up a $65 million valuation, six figures a week, sometimes seven figures of revenue. I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. I'm living in Malta. I've never even heard of Malta. I'm living there by myself, building a poker brand, right? And then April 15th, something called Black Friday happens. <laughs> all poker sites are shut down. I don't get shut down. But by default, I'm now one of the biggest brands in the world because my competitors get shut down, but I know that they can't pay their players back. So I have this horrible poop moment where I have to make a decision to pay every single player back and just shut my company down just because I didn't trust what the government was going to do because they had seized billions of dollars from my competitors. And so I didn't want to win like that, right? I don't want to win because all my competitors are dead or in jail. It's not how I want to win. And so the next four days I manually paid back 41,000 people manually, like, find their email address, find their bank account, find their PayPal, find like just manually paying back. And so that toughest decision was no decision at all. Meaning it's tough to want to close your company down and just hand back millions and millions of dollars. But I wanted to be able to sleep at night and it was the best thing that I ever did. Bad boy. Good for you. Good for you. That poop moment changed the rest of my life. So what happened was after those four days of misery, you know, paying out millions of dollars, being essentially broke, not knowing what to do the next week. Like, what do I do now? I got to move back with my tail between my legs. Like, what do I do? I actually started getting consulting gigs for major casinos, four of them, Morgan Stanley. I started making a bunch of money and it was allowed me to realize I'm never going to have all my eggs in one basket ever again. And so that's when I became an angel investor. That's when I started a social media agency. That's when I started everything that I'm doing now came from that poop moment. All my gold came from that poop. There are so many good principles that come out of that. The one I want to point out to our audience is it's very easy to be charitable when you're on top. 
it's not easy to be charitable uh, when you are at the bottom and you don't know if you can keep leveraging any funds that may not be there while you're on the bottom. So the fact that you did that is actually really impressive. Now, I know our audience is going to have a few questions on the other side that's like, wait a second, wait a second. This guy is 18, 19, 20, 21, year old, 21 years old. How in the world did you get in angel investors? How in the world uh, were you able to, to fund some of your, your early projects? Did you have a name? Did you have like a family name? Uh, did you have somebody to leverage? How in the world were you able to approach uh, angel investors and have these million dollar pops so early on in life? What, what's your story there? Absolutely. So there was no family money. What there was, was grit and family life. Like I knew that if I didn't work, there wasn't going to be food, right? And so what I did was there was never a break. I, I never, ever just sat there. I was never playing video games for hours at a time or watching TV for hours at a time. I was always doing something that could either build my name, my company name, generate buzz, generate sales. Like I had to always be doing something. I still act like that now, 20 years later. And so the number one thing that I did was I was constantly at events, conventions, conferences because there was remember there was no social media back then it's easy now the people that are listening it's easy now you can tweet at gary v and he'll respond to you you can you can go instagram dm the biggest venture capitalist in the world and they'll see it think about that you can literally slide in dms or linkedin or tweet at sequoia capital that household name venture capitalist like all of them and you can send it to 300 of them in the next six hours so it's literally a matter of just getting a portfolio of investors, sending your idea out to them with a handsome presentation and a compelling one. And that was kind of your approach. It was just work, 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 pitch. And just, it, you took a shotgun approach to a number of different investors with your ideas. It sounds like, is that accurate? So, yes. So my business plan was the most important thing and it's free. It's free to create a business plan. It's free to do social media. Everything I just said is free. None of it costs money. You don't have to have money to do these things. People are overwhelmed all the time. When I say you need a business plan, create social media accounts across every platform, network and engage with all these people. What did I just say cost money? Nothing. Zero. Literally zero. It just takes your time. And by the way, it doesn't need to be nine to five. You can keep your job. You want to work as an accountant or real estate agent, do that. But from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m., go nuts on social media, email people, build your business plan, work on your side hustle. Then I did that my whole life. In high school, I was working three different jobs selling cotton candy at the stadium, working at Ruby's diner with a sailor's hat on, working for a stockbroker for money, like 10 bucks an hour, like whatever I had to do, I was doing to save up money for my company. So the people that are listening, you do not need to be coming from money. You can't just point at me and say, oh, he had, I didn't have any of it. And I'm glad I didn't. Because if I would have been inherited a million dollars and started my company, it would have been gone. That's it. I would have just ran through it. Because I was, all I cared about was sales, sales, sales. When I had the energy drink, I got us into 43 distributors, 55,000 retail stores in four years. Wow. No social media back then. I just drove and flew everywhere and called, cold called. Budweiser, Coors, Miller, Pepsi, Costco, 7-Eleven, Ralph's, everybody. That's it. I didn't have any other way to get a hold of them. I just called them and showed up. And so there is nothing that can hold you back because I know I lived it from 23 to 27. I don't remember one single birthday, one single night, one girlfriend, nothing. That four years, I just sold. Dan, I love your hard work, your grit, your tenacity, your faith in yourself, your confidence. And I tell you, you're a man after my own heart. We need to hang out. But I know what that would look like. That would be you and me side by side on a computer doing something very similar. It's just <laughs> creating, creating, doing, doing, producing, producing, producing. Because you're nonstop. I can, I, can, I can smell that from hundreds of miles away. And, and where are you calling from today? Where are you, where are you located? Los Angeles. In LA. Awesome. Well, very cool. Okay, so the next question that I'm imagining is burning in the hearts of our audience right now is you go through and, uh, in, in a, again, in a turnkey model uh, way, create these automated businesses over and over and over again. Now, your time's extremely scarce and extremely valuable, and every business that you create, it becomes more and more scarce and more and more valuable. So you obviously have an automated system that you put into place in each of these businesses. So I have a two-part question for you. Number one, what does that turnkey model tend to look like? And number two, and I should have asked that one first, uh, when, you, when you audit a company, when you invest into it or start to create it, um, how do you decide what 
what model needs to go into place or what uh, personnel need to go in place and how do you choose first? Sure. So when I'm first looking at investing in a company, if the founder and CEO are not a workhorse, I won't invest unless I can bring in a workhorse or somebody that can help be what I call the quarterback. I'm always going to be happy to be the coach, but I can't be on the field with them all the time. I can't be at every practice session all the time. I can't be with them in the gym. Like I, I have to be able to oversee them and help when they need me to, but ultimately they're the ones playing on the field day in and day out. And so the first thing I look for is can the investor or can the founder CEO work morning, noon, and night? That's mission critical. Now, can I place someone there? Fantastic. Next, can I scale this business? Is it scalable? I have a 40, 40, 20 rule. There's 40% of companies I invest in. I'm okay if they're like a base hit, you know, like, if I invest into an acai bowl location, if I invest into one, it's going to net 22% a year. It'll do 600K a year in average. Which, by the way, he knows what he's talking about. He just barely put his 30th acai location here in Utah today, correct? Today, yeah. <laughs> Congrats. Congrats, by the way. Over by Lagoon. That's fantastic. Anyway, keep going. And so when if I were only investing in one, that would be a safe bet, right? 40% out of my, out of my 140%, it's like, okay, that's going to do 600K a year. It's going to net 22%. I, it cost me 160K to open. Good business. 14 to 18 months from now, I'll break even. And then hopefully it'll scale from there. But the next 40% is more medium risk. What if I want to open five acai bowl locations or 10 or 20? That's now medium risk because there's more personnel. There's hundreds of employees, different cities. What if something happens? What if operations wise? Then there's the 20%, 40, 40, 20. The 20% is my high risk. Those are my shot at glories. Those are my angel investments into companies that I'm coming in in the first round or the pre-seed round, not knowing what the roadmap's gonna be, right? That's a clothing brand, that's a food product, that's a, you know, like, those are companies that, a jewelry company, a skincare brand, where I'm gonna come in and hope that that thing sells for $80 million one day or 20 million or 200 million, whatever, one day, but it's gonna be a long five, six, seven years along the way of, a lot of twists and turns, right? So I say that because it's safer when I brought up the Everbowl, the acai place, because they'd already had 21 locations before I invested. So they already had a bunch of spots. I know that they already did over 10 million bucks in revenue. I know that that was a business that people cared. My biggest thing, that's what I was leading to is, do people care? If you started a new brand, right? A new clothing company. Well, there's 30,000 30, new clothing brands a year. Does anybody care? If you start a new juice company, well, there's hundreds and hundreds of juice brands. Why does anybody care? And so I look for products or brands that people would care that it's come out. It can't just be the price because that's not, you can't build a moat around your business over price because your competitors are bigger than you and can just lower their price. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's it. It can't just be something that can be turned into a feature either. Look at Facebook. If, if Snapchat won't sell to Facebook or Instagram, fine, we'll make Instagram stories. I'm guessing you're about to say something about holistic value, including customer service, but, but where are we going? And so looking at, can somebody care? Will somebody care if this launch? Cause you, in order, order to scale, people have to care and hope and hopefully repeat order. If it's a one, one sale thing, I don't invest. So that's it. Those are my main things I'm looking for. Can somebody run it? Does anybody care? Will it get repeat orders? I, I think it's smart. I just, I think it's just generally smart. First things first, just get started. Okay. Make your business plan. Go register all the social media accounts, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, YouTube, register all of them. Go through the process. Act as if you're going to start. Make your incorporation, make your bank account, get everything set up because that will make partners, investors, employees, staff, whatever you're going to get involved, feel comfortable with you and believe in you more. If you've got eight social media accounts, a bank account, a business plan done, I believe you're actually going to go out there and do it. And let's call that own your name across all channels, right? Yes. Fantastic. Your social media account should be the same screen name across all the platforms, the same bio photo and the same bio. Because remember that game as a kid, like guess who you look, look at the name. Oh, is it Sally? And does Sally have glasses and red hair? You want to be that because we're bombarded by 3,500 logos and faces a day. And so you want to make it easy for us to remember you. So keep the same face photo, the same bio, the same everything across all social media platforms. Next, build omnipresence. This is critical. 
You don't know where your customers are going to find you and you don't know how they're going to find you. So you got to be on Google, you got to be on Yelp, you got to be on Twitter, you got to be on Facebook. I'm not saying you have to create social media content for every single platform, but create it for one platform that you like the most. Usually that's going to be Instagram or Facebook and then repurpose that content across every other social media platform. If it's relevant to LinkedIn, post it there. If it's not business related, don't post it there. Everything you post on Facebook can go on Instagram and Twitter no matter what. If it's fun for TikTok, post it there. If it's not, don't post it. Everything I said is free. However, building omnipresence across all these social media channels, you put yourself in a position to get lucky. Meaning, you're making all your content for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, and then the Harmon brothers see you on a LinkedIn post that goes viral. And they're like, you know what? We want to invest in you. I believe in your product. Harmon brothers come in and take you from 400K to 40 million. How did that happen? You put yourself in a position to get lucky because you were making content about your product that you were doing anyway. Meaning if you're going to go out there and sell a fitness product, make photos and videos because you're going to go out there and sell your fitness product anyway. If you do fitness related content, teaching people how to work out, you're going to make that content anyway, scale it, put it on every single platform. Love that. And to consolidate, exist everywhere, right? Even if you're not going to focus on that platform, exist there so that you're present. Omnipresence is, is what you mentioned. Exactly. Sign contracts with everyone, including your mom. And it's not that you're going to sue your mom. You're not going to make a big stack contract. One or two pages, it's called the scope of work. If mom's going to do this or I'm going to do this, this is what happens. If the Harmon brothers are going to do this, and your social media agency can do that. If you just explain what everybody's gonna do, it removes the biggest struggle in all relationships, which is communication. The reason that husbands and wives break up, the reason that staff gets upset with bosses, the reason that investors get upset with their founders is communication, the biggest thing. So make a one or two page scope of work explaining what you're gonna do, have open communication, your life will be way less drama filled. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Poop to Gold with the Dan Fleischman, the greatest podcast episode you've ever listened to, the most value-packed episode uh, that exists here on Harmon Brothers. Um, ben, you need to come back to the office more because this is good stuff. Dan, thank you so much. It's been such an op awesome opportunity getting to hang out with you, and uh, keep killing it, man. We're going to be following you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Catch you soon. Have a good one. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. That was incredible. If you want to check out more of Dan, check him out on all of his Instagram and he's omnipresent, right? Just look up at Dan Fleischman and like he said, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And if you want to check out more awesome podcasts like this, go to at Harmon Brothers and we'll be here for you. Keep on creating, guys. See ya.